Hello, I'm Holly Cummins. I'm a consultant in the IBM Garage. What I do in the Garage is I work with clients writing cloud native applications really and in the course of doing this I've seen how the use of Java in the cloud has changed over time and I've seen a lot of really cool things that you can do in the cloud with Java and I've seen a lot of really horrible things that you definitely shouldn't do in the cloud with Java. So this is such a great time to be a developer I think it I'm, I, I mean, I really, I love the cloud. There's so many things that used to be really tedious and horrible and slow, like provisioning machines. There was all this drudgery that we used to have to do. And now that's all taken care of by the cloud. It's, it's so elastic, it's so frictionless, it's really cool. Having said that, it's not all perfect in the cloud. We do see problems and we do see that habits that we head out of the cloud, we need to unlearn and we need to get a whole bunch of new ways of doing things in order to really thrive in a cloud environment. So in 2020, assuming you're using the cloud, there's a whole bunch of things that you've just got to be good at. Because it's 2020, the first is hand washing, um, whether you're in the cloud or out of the cloud. And of course, if, if we're writing applications, we, we've got to be good at the app side of it. That's still a core skill. But as well, increasingly, we need to be good at the ops side of it as well. We need to know how this thing is going to run and we need to be able to get it to production. We need to be able to get it running. And once you're doing apps and ops, then basically you're doing DevOps. And DevOps can mean a whole bunch of different things. Uh, sometimes it means doing both the development side and the operation side. Sometimes it just means doing CI, CD. And sometimes, of course, continuous integration and continuous delivery aren't actually continuous. And then DevOps just means build. But really, I think it should mean that idea of getting those fast feedback loops, of getting the dev side and the ops side working really harmoniously together. DevOps is great. But then security say, well, what about us? We, we don't want to leave that out and we want to get that as early in the cycle as possible because that's how it's going to work best. So then we get into DevSecOps and I, I won't go through every DevOps variation, DevBizOps, DevSecBizOps, but there's, there's a lot of them and we do, for a good reason, we do want to be less siloed. We want, do want to be working more closely together. There is another ops which is important, so I'll mention it, and that's FinOps. Now, FinOps was something that I learned about relatively recently, um, so if you're not familiar with FinOps, I'll, I'll come back to what it is. But as, as I mentioned, where where we are is that when when we do things in the cloud, a whole bunch of things that we may have been taught in university have been turned upside down. And what used to be a good idea is now a terrible idea in that cloud environment. So there's just things that are different if you're in the cloud. One has to do with how you, you manage your applications. So and this is where we come into the FinOps. The cloud, it's so wonderfully frictionless, assuming your organization hasn't put a whole bunch of really heavy governance in place. The cloud is so wonderfully frictionless to provision hardware. You can provision a server, you can provision a service, you can just keep provisioning things. But of course, that, that hardware, it's still running on a server somewhere, quite possibly in Virginia. And, and that hardware, it's still not free. It's still using electricity. It's still kicking out carbon if it's in Virginia. So we do need to still think about that. And there's a, a second problem, which is that we're paying for, or someone is paying for this application, but it may not even be doing anything useful. And, and I think, you know, we've all been here. When I was first learning Kubernetes, I started experimenting so I created a cluster and then I got sidetracked to something else and I forgot it for two months and then when I picked it up again I looked and I realized that this cluster it was a pretty well spec cluster so it was costing a thousand euros a month and it wasn't doing anything useful it was just sat there burning resources and that's kind of bad in in all sorts of ways and if 
if it's just one person doing that, that's bad. But of course, what we see is I do it, my colleagues do it, everybody else do does it. And to be honest, I still continue to do it. I still have a problem where I forget servers. And so then we just end up with this zombie problem which is, you know, as if we didn't have enough to worry about in 2020, but there's there's all these servers that are just sort of shuffling along. They're alive, but they're not useful. And they just, they are a real hazard. And you can sort of, you can see the, the scale of the hazard because if you look at some of the metrics. So there was a study that was done in 2017 and they looked at around 16,000 servers. So it was a pretty big study. And what they saw was 25% of those servers. So 4,000 servers were doing no useful work. And so the authors of the study said, well, perhaps someone forgot to turn them off. And that just happens all of the time. And we're still, I think we, there are things that we can do and there's new technologies coming here, but unfortunately this is not a solved problem. We still do have to rely on things like either putting in place automation to turn servers off which can make a huge difference or tagging which ends up being kind of manual or my favorite actually there's there's two favorites one is the plaintive email that goes around the department saying does anybody know what this server is i'd quite like to turn it off is that okay or the other thing that we see is the meeting where we just go through all of the servers to try and figure out what's going on so that's no fun for anybody. And this is where FinOps comes in. So FinOps, there's a there's an, a more proper definition for it, but really it is about accountability for cloud costs, which basically means figuring out who in your organization forgot to turn off their cloud and getting that cost flowing to them so that they have the incentive to remember to turn things off if they if it was an experiment and they don't need it anymore. Another thing that I think with management, what's changed in the cloud is it's just the scale of the problems got bigger, the complexity of the problems got bigger because that ease has made problems for ourselves. I really like thinking about tracing in the cloud just because what's happened is things that used to be a good idea outside the cloud, like writing to local disk and to make sure that you didn't run out of disk or, or overwrite your logs. You know, you'd sort of have fancy patterns for rotating between your logs. All of that is a horrible idea in the cloud because if your server goes down, it is gone. And so then you're not going to have access to those local logs. And as well, because we're the, the programming model has really shifted to one which is more distributed, even trying to keep a kind of a context that can flow through logs from all these different servers is really hard. So we're having to look at a whole bunch of new technologies in this area, things like distributed tracing, things like Zipkin, things just to try and allow us to get this fire hose of information and stitch it together into something which A, persists and B, actually helps us understand what's going on. Another thing where the conventional wisdom has, has or at least part of the conventional wisdom has been turned on its head has to do with packaging because it, it before we had containers we had various mechanisms for packaging things but one of the things one of the sort of the debates that that, that used to happen is fat jars versus applications plus servers and with the cloud i think that that argument is pretty much dead now because fat jars are pretty badly behaved in a container environment. I mean, they'll work, but you lose all of that layer caching that your container gives you. And so what you want to be doing is you want to be separating the parts of your application that change from the parts of your application that don't change. And you want sort of a little hierarchy so that the changiest things are at the top and that allows you to take advantage of caching. And that can make a really big difference to the speed with which you can deploy and test and that kind of thing. And more generally, our performance requirements have changed a lot. So, I mean, everybody always wanted things to be fast, but what fast is doesn't mean the same thing anymore. So it used to be that applications would be running in a big server and they would sometimes get restarted every six months. And on that kind of time scale, it, you don't really care how long it takes to start up, but you care a lot about the throughput. 
now these things are going up and down and up and down and up and down. And so that performance, that startup time makes a difference. And because you're paying for your cloud compute time, it is money. And you're also play, you often getting quite fine grained um, payment or accountability for your memory footprint. It's not just like it's on a server that you have sat in a data center. So there's a real downwards pressure on memory that is pretty new. And the combination of those two things means that we're seeing really new technologies that have are optimized for different things, but which I think are pretty great for everybody, like Quarkus. So one of the things that Quarkus does, which I find interesting, is it uses ahead of time compilation. And I used to do uh, a lot of work with Java performance. And one of the things that people would always say is, why do we have to have a just-in-time compiler? Why can't everything be compiled ahead of time? Wouldn't that be so much faster? And the answer was, no, actually, it's way slower to compile ahead of time. Because when your application's been running for a while, that just-in-time compiler is optimizing away and optimizing away and optimizing away. And it can see what happens at runtime. And it can make dynamic choices about what to optimize. So it gives you really good speed. If this thing comes up and then goes down again, you lose all that. And so at that point, ahead of time compilation does actually, it, it seems like an intuitively good idea always. And in this cloud environment, it really is a good idea. And so Quarkus can go just phenomenally, phenomenally fast because of the optimizations that it's made. Another thing that has changed a lot is we have to, and, and it still hasn't changed enough, I think, because it's not, this isn't a technology thing, this is a process thing. So we need to think, change how we think about releasing. So we have a whole bunch of stuff in our industry that is all set up to try and make releases really safe. And one of the things that goes with that is making, it, it's tailored for slow releases. And so if you can only release every six months, if you can only release every once a year because you're having to physically press your releases onto CDs, you do things in a certain way. But with the cloud, we can release really often. We're not bound to that slow release cadence anymore. And so these things that we're trying to reduce risk are actually increasing risk often because they they stop our ability to respond to customer needs and they often stop our ability to fix problems as well so we need to kind of adjust everything to go to instead of a model where we try and escape every single bug or prevent every single bug from escaping to the field it's all about that mean time to recovery and we should be optimizing that but that can feel a bit scary so i think we haven't quite got there yet and what we see sometimes is kind of a, a funny mix up between the new way of doing things and the old way of doing things. And that really, I don't think works at all. So we spoke to a, a large bank and they, they were sort of looking at their estate and their competitors were eating their lunch and they knew that in order to meet customer needs, they were just, they were gonna have to go more quickly with their IT. So they came to us and they said, you know, we're moving too slowly and we've looked and we've got this big COBOL estate and that hasn't really been a trendy technology for quite a long time. We need to modernize this thing. We need to get it into microservices so we have a modern architecture. And we said, oh, great, great. Yep, yep, we can, we can help you with that. And then they added, and our release board meets twice a year. And at that point, it doesn't matter how many microservices you have. If your release board only meets twice a year, those microservices are going to be released in a big lump twice a year. And at that point, they may as well not be microservices. You get some benefits with independent scaling, but that's a pretty small benefit. It's probably not worth it until you've gone and you've sorted out your releases. And we see, we see this a lot. We see people who've, who are scared of releasing their microservices independently. And so they have one huge pipeline to enforce that all the microservices are released at the same time, which again is sort of missing the point of microservices. And when we talk about microservices, one of the really big needs that microservices are addressing is that need for modularity. This isn't a, a new need at all. Uh, I think our industry in software has needed modularity from 
as long as we've been writing software pretty much. And I used to do a lot of work with OSGI. Um, in fact, I, I wrote a book on OSGI. And OS, one of the big problems that OSGI was solving was that modularity and also that ability to swap components in and out dynamically. So this isn't a new need, but with the cloud, what we have is we have the ability to have lots of little applications or lots of little servers and we can connect them to make one big application and so then that we have this sort of highly distributed model of computation and when it's done right it can give us some really great modularity and some really great release characteristics but it's important to remember microservices aren't the goal they're a really good means to to the goal but the goal is modularity the goal is higher quality decoupling getting to market faster all of those things microservices are just a tool that you use and so one of our senior architects he's got a rule of thumb when he's talking to a client and they they start talking about microservices if they say netflix netflix microservices netflix microservices he knows that they perhaps need to do some more thinking about what problem they're really trying to solve. If they're talking about coupling, about cohesion, then he knows that they're probably on the right track and they've they've got a good mental model for where they want to go and they're, they're thinking about some of the trade-offs as well. And that all that talk about Netflix, I think we do see this sort of wishful mimicry where we look at the outstanding engineering that Netflix do and we say, if I do microservices, I'll be like Netflix. Well, not unless we do lots of other things as well. And it may not even be appropriate to be like Netflix. You may have different problems that need a different solution. And it is totally okay. It is totally cool even to be on the cloud, to be cloud native without having lots of microservices if they don't make sense for your context. And the thing with microservices is that the, the dream is that we get decoupling, but decoupling doesn't happen for free. And I, I worked on a project and I sort of, I arrived and it was a slightly troubled project. And so I turned up on the first day and the team lead said to me, yeah, every time we touch one microservice, all the others break. I was like, okay, at that point, this is not a decoupled system. This is it, this is a distributed monolith and a distributed monolith is really bad. With a distributed monolith is you've got the worst of both worlds. So you lose that compile time checking that gives you some safety and you lose that sort of synchronous functional execution that, you know, has some problems, but it does at least no mean that you know that if you call someone it, it, something is happening, but you get all of the distributed computing fallacies still. And what we see often as well is that these can be really complex systems. So we maybe start out with a kind of a manageable number and then we add more connections and we add more coupling and then we add more connections and more coupling and then we add more. And then, wow, we've got a big mess and we need to deal with the distribution as well. This isn't a, exactly a microservices story, but I think it's such a good way of thinking about some of the trade-offs and some of the risks and how Coupling, coupling can never be eliminated. Coupling can only be managed. So this is the Mars Climate Explorer. And it had a rather sad fate, which is that it was intended to orbit nicely around Mars. And instead it just crashed right into Mars. And that was the end of the Climate Explorer. And when they did an investigation to figure out what had gone wrong, there was sort of a, a few things that were maybe not ideal in terms of the culture but the technical problem that caused the issue was that there was two two systems um, one was on earth and one was on the the spaceship the one on the spaceship used metrics units the one on earth used imperial units and to 
both teams, they hadn't bothered to talk about it because to both teams, it was so obvious what the right choice of units was. So they had this coupling on the unit choice that they hadn't realized that they had. And so then that meant that they, there was a problem. And of course, in this case, you know, it didn't matter how, it couldn't have been a more distributed system. Part of it was on Mars, but that didn't solve the underlying problem. So distributed and decoupled, we sometimes use them like they're synonyms. They are really not synonyms. So when, when you think about microservices and whether they make sense for you, there's obviously a lot of really good reasons to do microservices. There's some good reasons not to do them as well. Like if you're a small team, unless you have those requirements to do the independent scaling, it's probably not worth bothering. If you don't have any plans to release these things independently, either because it just doesn't make sense for the use case or because you know there's a whole bunch of heavy process around it, microservices probably don't make sense. And when you think about how these things are going to communicate and how you're going to bring in that false toler fault tolerance and how you're going to bring in the service discovery and all of those things, you're probably either going to end up with a service mesh or you're going to end up rolling your own service mesh, which isn't exactly ideal. So that again, you know, is that something that you want to take on? And finally, of course, thinking about the domain model, if the domain model doesn't split nicely, then that, that's going to be a headache. And the, in the case where every time the team touched one microservices, all of the other microservices broke, the, the problem turned out to be that there was this quite complicated domain model. And each, there was about 20 classes. Each class had about 70 fields. And each microservice needed to use that whole domain model. And so what, what they'd actually end up, ended up doing is in order to avoid the coupling to, by being in a common library, it had been that really complex object model had been cut and pasted into each microservice. But of course, that didn't eliminate the coupling. It just made it way harder to manage because if a field name changed, it still mattered. So when we think about microservices, the sort of the, the dream and the goal, is that we have a whole bunch of microservices and each microservice matches really neatly to a domain. In this bad case, the, that domain w was spanning all of the microservices and so they just couldn't get decoupled. And so then there was a problem. So everybody always says, if you're gonna do microservices, you need good automation. That is totally true. I would also add, if you're gonna do microservices, you need to get really good at testing. So one of the useful models for testing microservices is called the test pyramid. So at the top, you have your end-to-end -end integration tests. So those are the gold standard for tests, but they're kind of expensive to run. Well, in fact, they're super expensive to run, especially if you have 200 microservices that you need to stand up, but they give you a lot of confidence in the system. At the base of the pyramid, you have the unit tests. Those are cheap to run, easy to write, but the only problem is they don't necessarily give you a lot of confidence that the system actually works. So in that case where making changes broke everything, the unit tests were all passing beautifully, and yet the system was broken. So this is where the middle layer comes to the rescue. And the middle layer is contract tests. There's a few different contract test frameworks that you can use. Um, you can use things like Swagger. It doesn't give you quite enough, I would say. Um, it doesn't really give you the sort of, some of the, the things that the, the more advanced frameworks do in this context. So Spring Contract is a good option if you're if you're in the Spring ecosystem. Um, another option is Pact. The thing I really like about Pact is it is has support for I don't know how many, but it seems like zillions of languages. So there's Java bindings, Node.js bindings, Ruby bindings, PHP bindings, whatever language you're in, or if you're living the microservices dream and being polyglot, there is a Pact binding for you. And of course, what you want to be doing with your contract tests is going across that whole ecosystem. So then having multiple languages helps. So one of the, the analogies that Pact use for explaining why you really need to be thinking about contract testing is the fire alarm. So how do you test a fire alarm? 
This is certainly not how I test my fire alarm. It gives great confidence that the fire alarm works. I really hope that if the house goes on fire, the fire alarm makes a noise. But I don't want to set my house on fire every week just to give me confidence that the fire alarm works. I hope someone did it at some point, but you can't do that regularly. So at the other end, every fire alarm, it's got this little button on it that says test and push. And if you push it, it makes a loud noise. So you're supposed to do that once a week. It gives you great confidence that the fire alarm has the ability to make a noise. That's a really important feature for a fire alarm. But it's not the only one because I also really want to know that if exposed to smoke, the fire alarm is going to make the noise. So I'm, it's not quite enough. So what they have for fire alarms is that you can get these um, sort of testers and it's like, it's sort of like a cup on a long stick and then you sort of wrap it around the fire alarm and then it sort of releases a smoke into it. And then you're testing that key condition of if exposed to smoke, does the fire alarm make a noise without actually having to go to the trouble of burning your house down. So I'm gonna do a quick little demo of PACT um, and of some of the problems that it's solving. So I've got a little application here. And if I go to, this is, um, sort of a microservices application, but it's a very simple microservices application because I don't want to have 16 servers running on my machine while I'm trying to present. So it really, it has just a front end and a back end, which you might call a traditional application, but the challenges are exactly the same of how do I ensure these things work together? So I've got my local host, which is not running. Um, if I start it, then that will come up. And it will come up, but you can see it hasn't actually got a back end yet. It's just got a front end. Uh, so if I bring up my back end, this is running Liberty then that will come up in about five or ten seconds. So now if I reload this, oh, not quite there yet. There it is, ten seconds. Cool. So if I reload this, now I've got my person and I've got a model where my person moves from room to room, each room changes the state of a person. So you can see this is sort of quite analogous to uh, microservices where I've got my data model and it's going from room to room. And if I go to local host 9080, whoops, slash resident, can see there's my data model and I'm not thrilled with this torso bit what I'm trying to get at there is the stomach but torso is kind of a, a complicated word for that so if I look at my um, application um, on the Java side I've got my data model which is all of these body parts and then I've got rooms and it goes through the rooms and then I've got the resident, which actually holds the data model. So if I want to do a refactoring there and I say, let's call that stomach. Now, again, ideally, probably each each room would be in its own server. And when I did this refactoring, it wouldn't change each room. Um, but instead, oops, that was a spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, 
So it's changed stomach there, but it has not changed stomach there. <laughs> I don't know what went on there. Because, um, of course, what I was trying to show is that with the... Um, with the benefit of that IDE checking, everything will um, get updated when I make a change. So I've got stomach here, stomach here, everything should be good. Let's get rid of that. So, oh, I really did, that was, that was a really unsuccessful refactoring. So in fact, I'm demonstrating that what happens when you don't get the IDE support is you have to go through and you have to know to make it manually. But I think you can all see that that should have been an IDE support. Oh dear, and that's still get torso. And that should be stomach, okay. So, so you can see the sort of the slight pain involved of doing it without the IDE support. And if I go back and look at my data model, it's actually pretty much the same. So I've still got the torso here and that's all working. But of course, the reason I changed from torso was because I didn't like the word torso. And it could have been as well that I might have had a typo in it or something like that. So let's actually make this proper a proper change because here I've got a method called get torso, but it returns a stomach. So if instead I change it to stomach, and what's going on here is that um, this is in here, taking advantage of Jack's RS to serialize things down to the JSON. So now if I go here, I can see that my JSON has a stomach. And so if I go back here, what happens? <gasps> I have completely lost the stomach. So this code had an assumption that it was going to have an image called torso hungry. And since I changed it to stomach, that file doesn't exist anymore. So I had this quite subtle coupling, an assumption about the name, that then means I've lo completely lost my body part. And if I was to continue on and do more refactoring, who knows how many body parts I might lose. I might lose the hair, the arms, the legs, disaster. Um, over here, in this table, it's just listing what's in the JSON. So that's a bit more dynamic. That one doesn't actually have that coupling that the visualization has. So how can I fix this? So this is where Pact comes to the rescue. So I've Pact, it has two parts. You have a, well, you, you, three parts. You have a consumer. And what Pact gives your consumer is it gives it acts as a mock so it's really handy for testing so when i was writing this demo i was test driving my front end and i had a stupid logic problem with my um Java, json manipulation and i was able to use the packed mock to solve that on the provider side it will just rattle through every method in the contract and make sure it works and make sure it returns what it's expected. And the contract is the mechanism of communication between the consumer and the provider. And so normally you would generate the contracts in the consumer and then you would publish them either directly to the provider source control or to a broker. Once you've done that, then you get that validation on both sides. And so if I go here, if I, um, I'm going to start by, I'm not going to type everything out because I don't have that long, but I'm just going to show you the shape of it. So on my front end, I've got a test. This is a unit test. It's using a mock. And so if I take that and I make a copy of it and I'm going to call this contract dot oops contract dot test my 
now what I need to do is I need to um, I have an expected result I can continue to use that as the basis for my contract and that means I'm in a really good place because I probably don't want that many contract tests because it is still starting a server but I know that the data that my unit test is using is being validated by my contract test so then I can use that data with a lot of confidence in my unit tests and have a few contract tests so I'll do that I've got a few little test methods and if I wrap this around in some extra logic that sets up the expectations, sets up the packed server, and then I can run that and start getting results. So if I do npm run test now, it should run that and it should be a bit of a, oops, um, It should fail because I've sort of taken away one mock and I haven't put back in the um, packed mock. And you can see I've got this folder packed, which has nothing in it. And so if I wait, and you can see it was a little bit slow there as well. And yeah, it's not it's not happy. So if I go to um, what's in my source control. Um, you can see I need to bring in some packed things. I need to declare the, my contract that gives some names. And then th this is um, what this is doing as well. So I have my expected result that my unit tests are using. But then I want to say, for my unit test, please pass me this specific value. But the provider can return a bigger range. So in this case, for example, the hair can be frizzled or combed, the stomach can be full or hungry. So I bring in all that and then I define an interaction. And once I've done all that, and this is just indentation, I can run my tests. So let's undo um, my local changes so that I've just got what's in source control there. And then let's run all my tests. And then this should run and it should, it passes. So on the consumer side, it thinks it's called a torso. It's really happy. But of course the problem is that the consumer and the provider don't agree. So let's copy my, I'm gonna copy, oops. I'm gonna copy all my contracts from my consumer to my, my provider. Here it's easy because they're all in the same file system. Um, if I was doing it in a CI pipeline, I might do it with um, pushing it into source control. And the other thing to note is just to give a quick preview of what the contracts look like. They sort of look like this. So I've got a description of the interactions and what kind of responses are allowed if I hit that slash resident endpoint. So at this point now I can bring in a Java test. So the this you can see that the nice thing about this is I'm not going to type it all. I'm just going to pull it back from source control. But there's not much there. I say where to get the packed contract. I say the provider name, and then everything else is just saying to packed for each interaction. Here's where you find the server. It's going to be running on localhost 9080. So I do have to have a server running because um, this is just a sort of a, a Jakarta EE micro profile app. Um, so have that server running. Here's where you get the server. Hit all of the endpoints that the consumer asked you to and validate the results. So if I bring that in, I can then go and I can run it. Oh, I've still got <laughs> the results of my catastrophic refactoring in here. So if I run that now, let's see what's going on. Oh, that's been annoyingly slow, isn't it? 
estimates run that. And hooray, happy news. Um, I have a failure because my contract says it should be torso. So there's that expectation. And what's actually coming in is stomach. So if I look at that, I can see I've got this, this diff here. So if I change it back, if I go back to my resident and I try and do a slightly more successful refactoring, um, actually I can just do, if I change that back to get torso, this should make the application happy and it should also make this happy. So let's have a, oops. Let's have a run of that. Hooray! I have the stomach back because I called it a torso. And if I go here. Oh, <laughs> I still did the bad refactoring, didn't I? Change that back to torso. And let's run that. And then what we should see is, let's run that again. And you can see as well, the, the contract tests are way faster than doing a full integration test, but they're not so fast that you want to rely on them for all of your testing. You do still need that those unit tests as well. And I am really completely failing to run my tests or to get find my test results. <laughs> oh, look, there it is. The window is hidden, but I've got that check mark. So sure enough, changing it back did restore things. And if I, if I was determined to make it a stomach instead of a torso, of course, then I have to have a conversation with the team that is writing my front end and say, look, is this okay? Can we change our contract? And they say, sure. And then we go through that process. So, so what the point there really is just that if you've got those microservices, you really, you just have to be thinking about that automation and that testing and contract tests are a really great way of doing that. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Um, the code is available on GitHub at um, ibm.biz holly j future if you want to go have a look. Thank you.